top stories tonight. Nigerian government begins disbursement of presidential conditional grant. Naira abuse EFCC to arraign popular Lagos socialite Wednesday. Hundreds of Kenyan doctors rally in support of strike over improved working conditions. Togolese opposition alleges constitutional changes are presidential power grab. Thank you for joining us. I'm Felicity Ezewike. Our coverage tonight begins in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, where the government announced that it has started allocating 8,925 houses to deserving applicants across the country under the National Housing Program, NHP. Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, Makos Ogumbi, made this announcement in a statement released in Abuja. On November 1, 2023, the federal government set aside 50 billion naira to finance the construction of 40,000 units of housing under the Renewed Hope Agenda. The first batch of the allocation process has already been completed after conducting a thorough review of the conditions and procedures involved in the sale of houses under the NHP. Let's also tell you that the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment in Nigeria says it has begun disbursement of the Presidential Conditional Grant Scheme to verified applicants after an exhaustive selection process. The government, through the Bank of Industry, had said it would be disbursing three categories of funding, totaling 200 billion naira to support manufacturers and businesses across the country. In a progress report posted in the Trade Minister's Official X handle on Tuesday, Doris Anyete stated that an unspecified number of beneficiaries have received their grants, adding that by Friday, April 19, another significant disbursement will be made to a substantial number of verified applicants. This is coming more than eight months after President Bola Tinubu announced the grant for manufacturers and small businesses. Six policemen who were killed in Ugeli Delta State in March have been posthumously honored at an award and commendation ceremony in Abuja. Force Public Relations Officer Ulumuyiwa Adejobi made this known in a post on his ex handle on Tuesday. Adejobi also revealed that the families of the fallen officers were paid their entitlements and that they received donations from various government officials at the event. In March, the Nigerian police confirmed the deaths of six officers and six others while investigating the disappearance of three of their colleagues in Delta State. The police also said eight suspects were arrested in connection with their killing. Well, top, one of our top stories tonight, the Kano State Chapter of the All Progressive Congress State Working Committee has suspended ward party leaders, who earlier suspended the national chairman of the party, Abdullahi Gantije. The APC ward in Donkin Tofa, local government area, had suspended the party's national chairman on Monday. But in a swift reaction, the party thwarted the suspension and sacked those behind it. The state party chairman, Inusa Dawanu, said those behind the suspension were caught in anti-party activities and the records of meetings with the opposition were exposed. The state working committee adopted the suspension of the ward's APC leaders. It, however, clarified that Ganduje's suspension is invalid, null and void and cannot stand. Staying with development in Kanu, a political interest group in the All Progressive Congress APC, has condemned the purported sacking of the national chairman of the party, Umar Gandije. The group, under the umbrella of APC National Vanguard, describes the sacking as a political coup orchestrated by desperate individuals outside the party who are envious and felt threatened by Gandije's rising profile. 
The group said it understand that such calls and attempts to illegally sack the chairman can only be contemplated by anti-democratic forces and those who seek the fall of the APC party. It, however, called on Governor Abba Kabir Yusuf of Kano State to call his supporters to order and warned those that have been hired as missionaries to threaten Nigeria's democracy and causing strife within the APC to be ready to face justice. I reiterate our condemnation of the purported sack of His Excellency Alaji Omar Gandude as the national chairman of the APC. We expose the legal loophole in the alleged suspension, highlighting the fact that those who address the press conference are not card carrying members of our party, which, in regard of this elevation, makes the purported suspension null and void and would have no any effect on the national chairman. We further express our happiness at the good news that we, we, the world and the local government executives, having identified the persons involved in this unfortunate situation, have already prepared to charge them to cause for impersonation and calculated attempt to embarrass and dent the image of the party and that of the national chairman. We also issue a stand warning to those outside the APC who seek to join the party, urging them to do so in a manner that upholds honor civility and democratic values we hold there. We're joined now by our correspondent, Marvelous Bomanu. Marvelous, it's good to have you on the news. Um, go ahead and tell us what the latest is with the alleged suspension. What is the current political situation as regards the uh, party in Kano? Marvelous, if you can hear me, um, I'm trying to get an update from you. What is the current status as regards the alleged suspension? There's been a lot of activities surrounding that in Kanu. What can you tell us? Okay, we might need to come back to that conversation with Marvelous. We seem to be having uh, some issues with our connection. Uh, moving on now, up to the north, northeast of Nigeria specifically, the Kaduna State House of Assembly has set up a committee to probe all finances, loans and contract projects awarded under the former governor, Nasser El Rufai administration. Governor Ubasani had during a town hall meeting lamented the huge debt inherited from his predecessor on May 29, 2023. On Tuesday, the Assembly set up a committee to investigate El Rufai's top associate and senior counselor on investment, Jimmy Lawal. The panel would also probe financial dealings, loans and grants, and other project implementation from 2015 to 2023. The committee was also mandated to invite notable personalities, including the former Speaker of the Eight and Night Assembly, Commissioners of Finance, former Managing Directors of Kaduna Markets and Commissioners of Budget and Planning, among others. Okay, I understand we have my colleague, Mavalos Obomanu, live. Mavalos, just confirm that you can hear me, please. Yes, I can hear you. Great. A lot has been going on in Kanu lately, specifically the political situation with the alleged suspension of the national chairman. What updates do you have for us from there? Well, uh, the political tension here in Kano State has, you know, been boiling uh, in the last four days since um, the state government announced that they will be, you know, bringing uh, the former governor of the state, Abdullah Ganduje, to answer to some of the corruption charges preferred against him. So the tension here has been a bit uh, tense, both for those in the camp of the former governor, that of the governor, and of course the APC, being that this is, you know, a top politician and is the one in charge of the party, you know, uh, uh, the ruling party. And of course, some uh, um, uh, of the residents of Kano State, whom we've been able to speak with, 
are saying, some of them are saying that this is a political witch hunt, that the current governor is trying to witch hunt the former governor because of some of the issues he had with his former political godfather, who is uh, the known of that person, the Arabi Kwankwa. So, and of course, you know that some of them are saying that if the governor is actually out, you know, to, to, to you know, fight corruption and to make public leaders, you know, accountable for their stewardship during their time in public office, he should start as well, way back as 2011 when uh, Rabiu Kwankwazo was still, uh, you know, the governor of this state. I know some of them are just saying because of these issues, you know, that the governor has refused, you know, to focus on governance and then is witch hunting, you know, uh, um, the, the immediate past governor. But some of these cases that, they, you know, and you know that uh, Abdullah Eganduje, this is not the first time we are having, uh, uh, you know, some of these allegations against him. He has been one form of, you know, corruption allegation or the other. And ever since those allegations has come up, we've not really seen anything, you know, regarding actions on those allegations. And of course, by tomorrow, he'll be arraigned in, in a Kanu State High Court here. So, but earlier today, when we visited the court, it seems like nothing much is happening because some of the court officials we met, they don't even know that the court, the case will, you know, come up tomorrow. I mean, I and mean, uh, I mean, what you're, the, what the information you're giving uh, us. He said that some of uh, some of those people, interested parties, have not been served the summons. So some of them are yet to receive the summons. So he said he doesn't know if the arraignment will go on tomorrow, but let's wait till tomorrow. Indeed. I was just going to interject and say, we were talking about the suspension. Now you have an update that he is going to court um, to answer for corruption um, uh, charges. But what is the likelihood from what you've seen and from what we've seen on, on the media? What is the likelihood that the former governor will be coming to a Kanu state? And what is the connection between his alleged suspension and the corruption case? Of course, you know that um, the world, uh, at the world level, uh, they had a meeting which they, you know, suspended the former governor to allow him to come and answer to some of these you know, show corruption charges preferred against him. But of course, the state working committee waited you know, in, inside the matter and then suspended the group of people that had come to you know, suspend the governor, saying that they, has, they had information that they, they, those group had a meeting with government officials. And of course, it is anti-party you know, activity. But sometimes, when you know that if some of these government officials, both serving or immediate, when they have issues, especially those occupying government offices, one will, you know, actually expect that if you're having a, uh, you know, occupying a government office, either appointed or selected, and you have some of these cases, some will think that maybe you just vacate that seat, go and answer the corruption charges against you, and then if there is a prima facie in the case, of course, the trial will commence. If there is not, then you come back, just like what happened to Bethe when things happened and then the president was put to you know, suspend her and all. So you know that, uh, you know, at some point, so many people are saying that, you know, this is just like a three-legged dispense, you know, like a web. The, you know, world level there, he has been suspended and the state working committee, you know, had asked him not to listen to that suspension and in fact, you know, suspended those committee that sat and suspended the governor of anti-party activity and of, of course we going to the court and we learned that some of the, some, the writs have not been served on some of the parties and then we are now seeing that probably the arraignment might not hold tomorrow or not uh, based on what the court uh, the, the court uh, secretary told us that some of the writs has not been you know sent to the parties involved that is not sure whether the arraignment will go on tomorrow you, or not. You are, so you are a on the ground marvelous. We, we expect that uh, we go through. By the end of the day you see that uh, 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 the, 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 there is also an issue that we are saying that the state government lacks the local standard to initiate that criminal case. That a criminal case ought to be initiated by uh, by the federal, you know, you know, arm of the government, either the attorney general of the federation through the anti-graft agency like the EFCC or police. And you know that that case has been decided by a federal high court before. And then, of course, we don't know what you know, direction or how the trial judge in, the, in, in this case will see this. But at least let's all wait till tomorrow and see what happens. It is left for the judge to determine based on the evidence. Of course, the government said they will be calling 15 witnesses. I mean, know, the, uh, Marvellous, you are on the ground. I'm trying to interject uh, in the interest of time. You are on the ground, so we expect to get updates from you tomorrow whatever happens but in the interim i want you to tell us quickly what not from parties now those who have affiliation either to the governor or the former governor i want you to talk to us about what the people are saying to you about the political tension in the state and how it may possibly be affecting their daily lives 
or businesses? Of course, uh, some of them told us that during the eight-year spell of the former governor, Abdullah Ganduje, that the, the state has never witnessed such a peaceful atmosphere like they did during the former governor's tenure. And of course, some of the physical projects in the state were projects executed by the former governor. In fact, some of the projects he inherited from Rabiu Kwankwa, so and then he finished some of those projects, started his own and finished it. And of course, that instead of the current governor to focus on delivering governance to the people, he is busy with hunting the former governor, whom, according to them, have done the state, you know, a, a, a quite number of good projects that are very laudable and has yielded you know economic benefit to the state so some of them are of the opinion that this is a political witch hunt all right marvelous thank you very much for speaking with us i'm sure i'll be seeing you again tomorrow night do stay safe thank you now barely one month after the demolition of a section of jacunde estate in lagos residents are still in search of closure while the Lagos State Government is engaging the leaders of the Residents Association and addressing their concerns, the big question is how the huge housing deficit in the state and other major cities in the country can be reduced at the same time with urbanization and development. Providing answers to this, New Central today hosted a town hall meeting with the affected evictees of the estate and relevant stakeholders. Now, where are they taking us to? Another bush area? Now, and at that time, I was in SS3. I lost my father. Now, I'm, not, I, I, I'm a full man, a married man. Now, my children know this place as their own house. Now, they want to chase us out. By the time we go to a new allocation, I will be dead by then. What is, the, what, what is going to be my, my, the, the future of the children? That they will be dead. By the time they go to my they'll go to the garden again. So, this is not government. This is not democracy. We know how the party is democracy. And to God, we are the one voting for them. The big man, you cannot see a big man with a rolling paper. We are the one voting for them. But this is, is it, is it, is it, the, is it the way to pay back? Is it way to pay us back? Please, find something to do for us. I work in the community. I care about the community. And the television station, News Central, that I am the managing director of, we care about the community. What we keep saying is that people, we have to feel the pulse of the people and understand what they're going through. Because it is our job to let the government know what the people are going through. So News Central Television is a TV station that care about Nigerians and Africans. And we're going to continue to do this and let the government know. When the people are suffering, we will tell the government. News Central will also be organizing another town hall meeting with the victims and stakeholders of the Dosumu fire incident on Lagos Island. That will be on Friday at 11 p.m. local time. Do please find time to join us then. Coming up tonight, 32 states earmarked as high-risk flood-prone areas in 2024. We'll tell you more about this and the other stories we have after the break. Do stay with us. If you've just joined us, you're watching tonight. A reminder of some of our top stories. Nigerian government begins disbursement of presidential conditional grant. Hundreds of Kenyan doctors rally in support of strike over improved working conditions. Togolese opposition alleges constitutional changes of presidential power grab. It's good to know you're still with us. Now, election stakeholders in Nigeria have called for far-reaching reforms in the nation's electoral process in order to improve and build the confidence of citizens. They called for the amendment of the Nigeria's Electoral Act, expressing worry that it has been unable to compel candidates from political parties to play by the rules. Idong Joseph reports. A national multi-stakeholders forum convened to provide stakeholders with the opportunity to recommend areas needed for electoral reforms. Those Inspired by controversies that trailed the 2023 general end of cycle elections, especially surrounding the use of technology in voting and transmission of election results, they said there are visible gaps 
in the nation's electoral act. The quote unquote glitch is that Nigerians head off on election day remains a major drawback as far as the 2023 election is concerned. In no way we have a basic problem before the ballot papers, the necessary tools to get to the electorate members, they feel super bit tired that where are this thing coming from? And it's actually giving them a doubt of what is going on. Some school of thought believe that the election happens to be the best uh, so far, and some believe that, no, we can do better. Uh, but whether we can do better, whether that has been the best, there is one underlying factor that everybody agrees on. There is a need to have a reform. Stakeholders here suggest areas of the act which they think need amendments to improve Nigeria's electoral process. We cannot be using by modal system of accepting the results. It is not possible. We can't use the by modal system of taking the results manually and taking the result by electronic transmission. It says that we go by manual that we know it's going to favor us or we go with the transmission itself. So the law should be straightforward in that aspect. There has to be a clear definition of how our laws are interpreted. It's still not very clear how our laws are interpreted. For example, the interpretation of 25% of votes at least in two total of the 36 states. The consensus among stakeholders here is that there are gaps in the nation's electoral act that need amendments. They say that they hope recommendations drawn from the meeting will be adopted by relevant stakeholders to further improve the nation's electoral process. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. In a war against money laundering, terrorism financing and other financial crimes in Nigeria, anti-corruption experts say adequate information relating to beneficial ownership of assets is crucial to ending public service corruption. This was during a training session organized by Nigeria's Financial Intelligence Unit in partnership with the Rule of Law Coalition, aimed at building the capacity of law enforcement personnel in using available information to tackle graft. Joshua Imarai tells us more. According to the latest Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, Nigeria scored 145 out of 180 countries ranked. While many say this reflects the sorry state of corruption in the country, they agree there's a need to tackle this monster headlong. Some anti-corruption experts converge on Abuja, Nigeria's capital to train personnel from anti-graph agencies on how to utilize beneficial ownership information to combat corruption. We cannot have a comprehensive BO. For real, it's not going to happen. Already I know that uh, FRS have one that they already have, METI has. So this BO that we're talking about, yes, the company registry is hosting that very large uh, BO data that we're looking out for, but there will be pockets of them here and there. So what I want to put on the table before you go into the serious business you are here for is to say that start thinking of how these data will talk to each other. They say the information now collated in the registry will help on the beneficiaries of wild-scale corruption. It may not necessarily be a magic wand that causes all the anti-corruption issues in the country to go away, but it is a very critical step because if we are able to lift the veil, if we are able to you know, go beyond the facade of who has committed the crime, the organization that seems to be behind the crime, to get to the actual personnel, the actual person who benefits from the crime, then we are a step closer to nipping those crimes in the board. While experts have lauded the effectiveness of utilizing beneficial ownership information, law enforcement agencies from Nigeria say its effectiveness and efficacy in prosecuting perpetrators of various financial crimes have been tremendous. The Corporate Affairs Commission, which is the primary agency that is responsible for the registration of all you know, legal entities of Nigeria, has granted us an, 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 an online access. So it means we can stay in our office and have access to their data, you know, which has been a game changer for us. It has helped us a lot in identifying the people that are behind you know, some of this uh, uh, trafficking. As Nigeria continues its efforts in the fight against corruption, 
This collaboration and training initiative underscores the visible commitment to transparency and accountability. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarai. Let's now tell you that the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission will on Wednesday arraign a businessman and socialite, Pascal Ukechuku, popularly known as Kubana Chief Priest, before the Federal High Court in Lagos over allegations of abusing the Naira. Kubana Chief Priest will be arraigned before Justice Kainde Ogundari on a three-count charge of allegedly spraying and tampering with the Naira notes at a social event, contrary to the provisions of the Central Bank Act of 2007. This is coming days after the EFCC arraigned controversial cross-dresser popularly known as Bobriski on similar charges for which he was sentenced to a six-month jail term. Let's go to Abia State. Following the strange death of a naval cadet officer of the Nigerian Defense Academy Kaduna at the Hotel Royal Dam Great a week ago, the family and community of the deceased are calling for an inquest into the debt. They want answers to the many questions arising from the unfortunate situation. New Central's Chinwe Ugele has been following the development. With this call, men, women, the children, young and old, came out to embark on a protest over the death of Chidebere Emmanuel Onyomere Neche, an officer cadet. It is a situation that has thrown the immediate family and all concerned into mourning. I'm devastated, but what can somebody do? I can See, if there is something I will do to wake up Chidebe, I will do that. Nothing brings Chidebe back now. Nothing. Nothing will bring Chidebe back. We will bet in one justice. We are not happy at all. And there is no way we will be happy when our uh, child is uh, uh, murdered that way. The principal suspect in all of this happens to be the deceased friend and a fellow officer cadet, Valentine Obeche. To a great surprise, according to Valentine, I did it. what he told me, that after swimming for some time, he raised his head and looked towards the place she the better was sitting. Behold, it was the car key. The the inability of the hotel to account for the whereabouts of Chidebere several hours after he was declared missing raises questions as to what security measures the hotel management put in place. But we are here to make the government know that we want justice to prevail. But investigations will be carried out to ensure that if there were perpetrators of this act, it will be unraveled and justice will be seen to be done. This situation has sadly taken the life of the food and beverage manager of the hotel, James Etubi, after he was allegedly beaten alongside other workers at a military formation in Omaha. The hotel manager refused to grant access for media coverage of the scene of the incident, stating that there was enough news already. The Nigerian Army and the Abia State Police Command, on the other hand, say they have launched a comprehensive investigation into the entire scenario to unravel the mystery surrounding the death. Right behind me is Chidebere's father's house from where he went to Damgrit Hotel on that fateful day in the company of his friend Valentine, a fellow cadet officer, but never returned. The family are now asking for justice to be served in order to unravel the mystery surrounding the untimely death of their son. In Omahafani Central, Chinwe Ugele. About 32 states in Nigeria have been earmarked as high-risk flood-prone areas. This was as the Nigeria Hydrological Services Agency released the 2024 annual flood outlook where they called for effective measures to mitigate the expected effects of flooding on citizens. Amadine Ui has details. Flooding has in recent times had devastating effects in Nigeria. Experts say the 2022 floods comes to mind 
as the nation suffered heavy losses in billions of dollars. Flooding has become a perennial incident in Nigeria with attendant impacts such as loss of lives, destruction of properties, displacement and loss of livelihood among others. The total economic damage to residential and non-residential buildings, infrastructure, product, productive sector and farmlands from the 2022 floods was estimated at 6.68 billion US dollars by the World Bank Global Rapid Pulse Disaster Management Damage Estimation Assessment. As stakeholders converge on Nigeria's capital Abuja for the 2024 annual flood outlook, they say 32 states, including almost 150 local government areas, have been earmarked to fall under high risk flood prone areas and experience flooding this year. The level of floods in this category is expected to be high in terms of impact on the population, agriculture, livelihoods, livestock and infrastructure, and the environment. Part of 72 local government across the country fall within the high flood risk areas in the months of April, May, and June. Why part of 135 local government areas in the months of July, August, and September, and part of 44 local government areas in the months of October and November 2024 are within the high flood risk zones. We must increase very strategically and responsibly water harvesting technologies so that rather than have flooding, let people have water stored for them to be able to do dry season farming or irrigation farming. They are calling on state governments to prepare beforehand so as to be able to mitigate the effects on citizens. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadine Uyi. As the world celebrates World Envelope Day, this story you're about to watch delves into the fascinating journey of the envelope, a seemingly simple yet ingeniously designed object that has been a cornerstone of communication for centuries. It also unwraps the envelope's current standing in Nigeria, along with the outlook of the country's paper industry. New Centre's Ni Omani has more. It begins with a humble sheet of paper, which is carefully measured and cut into specific shapes. Each piece is designed to interlock and fold in a way that provides security and privacy for the contents within. In Nigeria, despite the rise of digital communication, envelopes continue to be a preferred method for sending physical documents, particularly in rural areas with limited internet access. According to a study conducted by the Nigerian Postal Service, over 60% of official documents are still transmitted through traditional mail, highlighting the enduring importance of envelopes in the country. 50, 40. For envelope manufacturers, designers and postal agencies, the envelope maintains its importance in both business and personal affairs, symbolizing respect and formality. Envelopes might not necessarily be seen as an essential product, but uh, for us here in Nigeria, uh, envelope creates jobs. Envelope still has a very bright future in this country because you will still need documents to be handed to you physically. You will still, not everything can be sent by email. I can't send you your C of O of your house by email. The demand for paper goods, including envelopes, remain robust in areas where digital penetration is low or where tradition prefers paper, making the prospects for the paper industry promising. With a growing emphasis on sustainable and eco-friendly materials, papers offer a preferable solution, but the Nigerian paper industry has its challenges. The paper industry in Nigeria is only responsible for 0.1% seven percent of our gross domestic product as the fifth largest producer of paper in africa we are only responsible for three percent and south africa is responsible for 65 percent 
of the volume of trade. So it means that we can grow exponentially if we improve the domestic environment in which we operate to make it a lot easier. As we have disruptions coming from the digital space to paper, we are also seeing new opportunities because of the issues of climate change, uh, because of issues of the environment, opening up the space for paper products. You know, our paper products are biodegradable. As the world celebrates World Envelope Day, the role of the envelope in history and its enduring presence in our lives is a reminder of the power of a simple piece of folded paper to connect people across distances and through time. In Lagos for New Central, Ni Omani. I for one still use the envelope. Still ahead, hundreds of Kenyan doctors rally in support of strike. More after the break. Just stay with us. New Central continues tonight in West Africa, where the opposition in Togo has denounced the proposed new constitution as a power grab intended to extend the reign of President Fure Nasimbe. The reforms would see Togo move from a presidential to a parliamentary system. However, the opposition says there are a ruse to keep Nasimbe already in his fourth term in power. We now head to East, where hundreds of hospital doctors joined a demonstration in the streets of the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, on Tuesday as a nationwide strike by medics neared its fourth week. About a dozen riot police in pickup trucks monitored the protest, which was not authorized by the authorities. Members of the 7,000 strong Kenya medical practitioners, pharmacists and dentist union have been on strike since March 13 to demand better pay and working conditions, disrupting health care at the country's 57 public hospitals. Up next is business news. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Talking business tonight, the Nigerian government has responded to demands from domestic crude oil refiners and sector operators by allowing indigenous refineries to purchase crude oil in either Naira or dollars. Chief Executive of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, Binga Kumalafe, said the new template will ensure a seamless implementation of the domestic crude oil supply obligation and maintain a consistent supply of crude oil to domestic refineries. He also highlighted that the flexibility to transact in either Naira or dollars would alleviate pressure on the country's foreign exchange rates, potentially benefiting the overall economy. The Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission introduced the new templates for the domestic crude oil supply obligation in line with the provisions of the Petroleum Industry Act 2021. And now, in coordination with the Ministry of Finance, the Central Bank of Egypt announced the offering of fixed coupon treasury bonds called T-bonds in the Egyptian pound with a value of 500 million pounds, as stated on the CBE's website. The auction for these T-bonds will have a maturity period of five years, ending on the 16th of April 2029, as mentioned in the bank's statement. A coupon refers to the annual interest paid on a bond. Investors who hold the bond received coupon payments, which can be paid annually or biannually from the time of issuance until the bond reaches maturity, as explained by the Daily Forex website. Let's also tell you that in an effort to combat deforestation and address climate change, Zambia has instructed the Director of Forestry to cease issuing permits for charcoal production in three districts. Green Economy and Environment Minister Collins Nzovu stated that individuals with valid cord wood permits in Itezi Tezi, Mumbwa and Shibuyunji districts have until May 1 to complete charcoal production. 
The forestry department will assess tree stock levels across the country and may extend the ban to additional districts. The decision to implement the ban stems from the significant levels of deforestation and land degradation caused by illegal and extensive tree cutting for charcoal production. South Africa has taken an initial step towards filing a complaint with the World Trade Organization against the European Union regarding its treatment of citrus imports from the country. Two years ago, the EU implemented additional refrigeration requirements for incoming fruit from South Africa to address citrus black spot, a fungal disease that causes dark spots on fruits. The EU's measures have increased costs and reduced shipments from South Africa, impacting its competitiveness in the citrus market. South Africa argues that citrus black spot does not affect the fruit's quality and disputes the classification of its shipments as tainted with the disease. The country has sent an official demand for consultations to the EU, marking a step towards filing a case with the World Trade Organization. And that's all on business news. Do stay with us. We still have more stories to come your way. I am Likon on Obanjo. Business news in association with Money Master PSB. The easy way to master your money. For the latest sports news, let's now join Favour Itwa. Sports Update, brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil, we go the extra mile. A sport. On March the 30th of the Nigeria Premier Football League, Enugu Rangers kept their place at the top of the league when they beat Abia Warrior three goals to two in a five-goal thriller at the Nabdi Azikiwe Stadium in Enugu. A brace from Kazim Oguleye and Isaac Savior ensured that the Flying Antelopes got bragging rights in the Oriental Derby. At other venues, Aqua United continued their fight against relegation through Ubong Friday's hat-trick, which earned them a 4-1 win against Niger Tornadoes. Fiesta United played out a 1-1 draw against Katina United and Sporting Lagos, got a 1-0 win victory against Sunshine Stars in the Southwest Derby. Still talking football, the national draw for the men's and women's versions of this year's Federation Cup competition will take place on Thursday, 18th April 2024 at the NFF Secretariat in Abuja. Already, the field for the national competition in the men's draw has been trimmed to 64 following last week's playoff matches. The men's competition will begin with round six of 64 matches, before the round of 32 and then round of 16 to the quarterfinals, semifinals, and then the grand finale. The women's competition, which has 31 entries, will begin the round of 32 games, then the round of 16, before the quarterfinals, semifinals, and the grand finale. Away from football now to the Olympics. We had the Olympic flame for the Olympic Games, Paris 2024, burst into life today, Tuesday, 16th of April, during a special ceremony at the archaeological site of Olympia, the birthplace of the ancient Olympic Games. During a ritual that links the modern Olympic Games to its ancient origins, the Olympic flame was lit in front of the ruins of the Temple of Hera by an actress playing the part of the High Priestess. Several important dignitaries, including IOC President Thomas Bach and Paris 2024 President Tony Estangwe, were in attendance for the event, which marked the start of the flame's journey from Greece to Paris, we had to arrive on the 26th of July for the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games Paris 2024. And our tour brought us to Olympia to enjoy all of the festivities dealing with the flame. Of course, what does the flame mean across the world? Universal peace. And we are hopeful that that will come to all countries. 
And to wrap up sports update, to go straight to the world of tennis, where Rafael Nadal made a light walk of Flavio Corboli on the triumphant return from injury at the Barcelona Open on Tuesday. The 22-time Grand Slam champion had not played an ATP Tour match since January, but dispatched the Italian 6-2-6-3 in one hour and 25 minutes to reach the second round. Nadal, who is 37 years of age, was able to play on clay for the first time since winning the French Open in 2022 and showed flashes of his usual brilliance in a solid display. I, I tried a lot of times in my career. It's true that uh, every time it's more difficult, and especially when you are in an advanced, advanced age, uh, it makes the things uh, even tougher. No, but uh, yeah. And that's it on sports update and favor Itwa. Up next is entertainment. Sports Update, brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil, we go the extra mile. Entertainment News, in association with Glow Unlimited. Austin Peters' biopic for Milayo Ransom Kuti is set to hit cinemas nationwide on May 17, 2024. Following its successful limited screening in 2023 at Silverbed Cinema in Lagos, the film, which received praise from the Anikolakpo Kuti family, chronicles the life of Fumilayo Ransom Kuti from her days as the first female pup pupil at Abiokuta Grammar School to her activism alongside husband Israel Ransom Kuti. Their work with the Abiokuta Women's Union challenged injustice, sparking conflicts with traditional and colonial leaders. Featuring outstanding performances like Joke Silva, Kende Bankole, Aduni Ade, and others, the film garnered two awards at the Africa International Film Festival. The best overall feature film as the best overall feature film and best screenplay. Fumila Yoransome Kutsi underscores the rising interest in showcasing the lives of influential Nigerians through cinema, paying tribute to the resilience and determination of an extraordinary woman. Let's take a look at that trailer. A young woman is a woman with a voice. There is no force more powerful than a woman destined to rise. Each time a woman stands up for herself, she stands up for all women. Every woman succeeds. And now Tyler Perry has signed a new multi-year deal with BET Media Group, renewing eight of his shows for BET and its BET Plus streaming platforms. The deal includes the renewal of popular series such as Tyler Perry's Sisters and The Oval. Additionally, BT has ordered a new scripted series titled Route 187. This is a crime drama which this is a crime drama which will be executive produced, directed, and written by Perry. The non-exclusive deal replaces Perry's previous partnership with BET, which began in 2019 and saw the, the creation of hit series and, and spin-offs. BET Media Group President CEO Scott Mills praised Perry's unparalleled ability to resonate with audiences across genres and platforms, expressing excitement about extending their partnership for years to come. And that's all we'll take on entertainment tonight. We'll take a short break, and when we're back, we'll bring you the updates on what's trending. Entertainment news in association with Glow Unlimited. Now, moving away from entertainment news, the administration of President Bola Tinibu takes the center stage in our trending stories today. Once again, his administration has come under criticism by Nigerians on social media amidst acknowledgement of the strengthening of the Naira, initiation of student loan program, commencement of distribution of palliative loans, and implementation of various economic growth initiatives. 
Nigerians keep criticizing the administration's approach with emphasis on perceived negligence in addressing key concerns related to financial prudence and transparency. Critics have said that the aforementioned advancements may be illusory, alleging government, governmental manipulations of economic indicators to create the appearance of progress. Let us now take some reactions on X, on X rather, so you can see for yourself what Nigerians had to say. Precious is saying, the Tinubu administration has consistently avoided addressing the crucial issue of budget padding. Essential for a nation's economic growth, and even more concerning is the fact that these billions which are being looted are borrowed money. Jude of Lagos is saying, APC has never for one day opened a space to address the issue of budget padding and misappropriation of funds, and they all claim to have the interest of the country at heart. We have another tweet from Bali Agba saying, if Tunibu is paying subsidy higher than before, and manage the economy to what it is today, paying some major debt, increasing FAAC to about 100%, paid some backlog in sports ministry and others, increases reserve and sterilized forex. Then Tinubu deserve his flowers. Another one from Oloye saying, they cancelled fuel subsidy. They pay more for fuel sub subsidy now, but fuel is more expensive than when they were paying lower for fuel subsidy. They floated Naira, they are defending Naira with more dollar now, but Naira is more expensive than when they were defending Naira. And that's all for tonight on What's Trending. You can share your thoughts as well across our social media platforms at New Central TV. I'm Jadel Simon.